Hi, this is Angelo John Lewis for the Diversity and Spirituality Network video podcast. Today, I'm privileged to interview W. Michael Ashcraft, a professor of religion at Truman State University in Kirksville, Missouri. Michael is an authority on the emerging field of new religious movements and is co-editor with Eugene V. Gallagher of the mammoth five-volume set, Introduction to New and Alternative Religions in America. Michael's book, A Historical Introduction to the Study of New Religious Movements, has just been published by Routledge. Michael, welcome to the podcast. Um, you know, Michael, I, I think a first question uh, to ask you is, um, why should anybody care about new religious movements? Because um, all religions start out as new religions. So if you have any interest at all in your spiritual life or faith, then the new religions can tell us something about how as human beings we come together and share our spirituality and share our perceptions uh, of, of what uh, are the ultimate realities and questions of the world. Do you have any sense as to how many of these things are there in the United States or worldwide? No, people are always trying to peg a number. What we're talking about is a process where usually a small group of individuals come together, maybe they've split off from a more formalized religion, and they begin to create a community on their own. They may borrow ideas, uh, rituals from other places, and this is a process that is continuous. So at any moment in time, who knows, thousands probably of individual groups, um, they come and go, uh, some of them survive, a lot of them don't. So it's, it, yeah, it's really hard to tell how many there are. I saw on Wikipedia there was an estimate by some scholar um, that there were 300 in the United States alone, and the, the, the persons indicated there are probably 10,000 worldwide. And, um, you know, as, as you indicate, they, all religions start from a small group of people, and some survive and some don't. Um, I wonder if there's anything about the... Um, uh, is there anything you could say about um, why they emerge or what particular periods have been particularly ripe for the emergence of new religious movements? Well, I think they emerge all the time, but yes, you're right. Some historical eras seem to be more conducive than others. Uh, probably the most dramatic one in recent American history was in the 60s <clears throat> with the counterculture. The counterculture seemed to be a permissive uh, kind of uh, atmosphere where students not only could, or not just students, but young people, all kinds of people, could experiment with lots of things that um, enhanced their awareness, uh, uh, fulfilled their desires, um, uh, simply made the world bigger for them than it had been before. And among those things were spiritual and religious experimentation. So a lot of the new religions that were named that, new religious movements at the time in the 60s and 70s, uh, they didn't necessarily have their roots in the counterculture, but they came along at an opportune moment when the counterculture had prepared the ground and made it possible for thousands and thousands of young adults to give them a try. And perhaps 10 years earlier, uh, or even 10 years later, maybe, uh, th that moment wouldn't have been there. Although I do think that since then, since the 70s for sure, our culture in general has been much more open-minded about these diverse religions that uh, would have been back in the 50s or, or the 40s have been condemned and shut down in one way or another. Yeah, I remember um, growing up in the 60s or the 70s, there was a lot of um, pushback about these groups and they were labeled cults. Yeah. And it seems that the maybe the attitudes of the larger society and also established religions has softened a little bit. Can you say? Would you would you say that that's a? Would you agree that that's a case, or has it not? I no, I think that's right. But I think our society in general has become more tolerant of diversity uh, than it was before. That's not to say that the fifties were um, uh, somehow. Uh, conf uh, it's a stereotype the 1950s as a time when nobody could express anything. I don't <laughs> right. think that's true at all. 
um, the 60s came from somewhere. Right. And, and they came from the, the precedents that were set in the 50s. So, but yes, I think in all areas, when it comes to civil rights and gender politics and sexual orientation, um, you know, all kinds of ways that human beings organize and express themselves, I think our society in general is far more tolerant than it used to be. In my own lifetime, I can see just in my adult years, um, it seems like th there have been strides made that I would have never guessed when I was 20 or 30 would ever happen. Um, and the students that I teach in college these days, the millennials, they have a kind of built-in tolerance for diversity, even if they come from a conservative background, mm. <laughs> that I st it still catches me off guard sometimes. Um, I don't have to work nearly as hard as I used to, say, 20 or, or so years ago, to get students to kind of open up and be, and be open to, to different viewpoints, and maybe viewpoints that their parents opposed when they were growing up. The millennials as a group, and it, I mean, it's, it's, very, it's very tricky to, to speak of an entire generation, but the millennials as a group just seem to be uh, more willing to accept differences among people. They've grown up with that, I guess. And, and it makes me hopeful, very hopeful for the future. You know, we're, we're a little bit fixated as, as far as cultural landmarks go. We, we talk about the 60s and the 70s as being, um, you know, this watershed moment where all these kind of things flowered. But I know from your studies, you've, you've studied uh, an earlier era. And I myself remember being fascinated by the Theosophists and all these, right. uh, I'll call them new religious movements of, of another day. Uh, That's and right. I, yeah, and I'm wondering if there's any, um, you see parallels between um, Annie Besant and the Theosophists and all those sort of people and the, the new, new religious movements of uh, yesteryear, I guess at this point, around the 60s yeah. and today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, uh, actually, there was a woman uh, at the Theosophical community I studied for my dissertation that is like a bridge figure, and I've often thought about writing about her because she's so fascinating. She grew up at the Theosophical Society in the 19-teens, 1920s. Uh, by the 1930s, she would have been middle-aged. Her name was Judith Tyberg, and in the 1960s, when she was elderly, she excited a group of Chapman College students who were looking for alternative religions, and they found their way to her her place. It was the East-West Cultural Center in Los Angeles. And what she did is she taught uh, the, the, the theory, the philosophy of an Indian uh, thinker named Sri Aurobindo. Oh, yes. Yeah. And so she was just offering to them what she had discovered in the 1940s when she lived in India and came back to the United States. And now her life spans the 40s, the 50s, and now the 60s, she's elderly. I think she finally dies in 1980. But she excited this group of students from Chapman, now Chapman University there in Southern California. And many of them went on to travel to India to Sri Aurobindo's ashram and to the experimental community Oroville there in uh, Pondicherry. Very famous. In Southern India, yeah. So there's a person that you can point to as a bridge figure. Her roots were in an older new religion from the turn of the century, but in her old age, she was directly influencing 60s counterculture college students who then went on in their own lives to do whatever they were going to do with the spirituality. And I interviewed several of them, and you know, some of them remained in the Aurobindo orbit. Uh, others went on to, to further experiment with various Eastern philosophies. Now, um... I wonder, I mean, you're a scholar, so at some point you probably thought about classifying types of new religious movements. Can you say yeah. a little bit about that? Well, the, the, the classifications are endless. <laughs> the <typologies. laughs> uh, there, there are a lot of them. And at one point in the 1980s and even the 1990s, any sociologist of religion interested in new religions worth his or her salt came up with a typology. <laughs> What's Mike's, what's Mike's, what's Mike's top topology? Um, <laughs> probably more, I, I've been influenced very much by the, the uh, categorization of a guy named J. Gordon Melton. Yes. Probably 
Mr. New Religious yeah. Movements. If anybody he's the man, podcast, right. He, he is the man. And in a book that he initially published in 1978, um, uh, Encyclopedia of American Religion, what he did is he categorized all religions in the United States, the, the mainstream ones and the new ones, in terms of families. And he had gotten this concept somehow from his study of geology as an undergrad. Wow. <laughs> what he did is he, he just broke them down according to belief, essentially, um, and put them into family groupings. So there's the Pentecostal holiness family, there's the Roman Catholic family. Uh, and then, you know, with the new religious movements, he had like a uh, esoteric family of things like theosophy and the occult. And then there were like Christian spinoffs, like the Unification Church or the Children of God. There were the Eastern religion spinoffs, like Hari Krishna and Soka Gakkai from Japan and so on. Um, the, the value of that kind of classification is that it, it's easy. It's, it's easy to grasp it. It's easy to work with it. The downfall of it, well, maybe not downfall, but one of the negative things is that it's hard to get specific on variables when you're comparing groups that way. Um, so it has a lot of what I would call teaching value. That is, if I want to introduce this concept to students in a classroom, they can get this without any trouble at all. Oh, yeah, sure, families of religions, they bear some resemblances to each other. If you're trying to use this system to do some very fine-grained research, then you might want to go to a different typology. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I guess the last question for you, Mike, and, you know, we could talk about this for hours because um, it's a fascinating subject, at least to me. Um, you know, this is a we're in a we're in a, we're in a, a very, um, I guess, by some measures, very tumultuous time. A lot of new things are emerging and a, a lot of um, maybe even confusion um, happens uh, for seekers. So. I guess a broad question. I'll let you answer it any way you like. Um, what what does this what is the importance of understanding this phenomena for modern people of any sort? Any, I guess let's confine it maybe to seekers. Um, well, first of all, I think just being aware of this phenomenon. Um, I would think would be reassuring to seekers who may feel like that they're out there by themselves and what they are attempting to put together in their lives is unique to them. They may or may not have very good support uh, from other people. And I think they need to know that they're not alone. There are millions of people in America today for whom this is um, almost a way of life, but certainly, uh, I think lots of people, if you want to talk about it developmentally, lots of people go through a phase in their life, and it may be as a young adult, it may be later, at least one phase, maybe multiple phases, of making shifts, of making changes spiritually. And as they do that, they build on their experiences, and they begin, and they continue to develop their own sense of self that is a result of all those experiences. And so... Uh, again, I think it would be reassuring for many of them, especially if they if they're struggling with trauma, depression, often those things are mixed into our own spiritual journeys, that um, there are lots of other people like them. And if they are not finding someone supportive in the venues and the organizations where they are now, keep looking, <laughs> mm. because uh, in contrast to other historic periods these days, there is tremendous support they're available you just got to be able to find it so Don't um thank you um so dr Oshkoff, if, if somebody wanted to know more about your work i know you have this book you've written several books give me a, a way to enter into this world from the uh, point of view of yourself in other words you've written several books so maybe you can tell me a little bit about well um yeah as far as an entry point uh another scholar and i edited an anthology of primary documents. It's called The New Religious Movements, A Documentary Reader, and it's been published by New York University Press. It's been out for a number of years. I think 2005 is when it was published. And so it would be easy enough to get a used copy fairly reasonably priced. Uh, it's in paperback. And 
the uh, so what we did was the other the other scholar kind of set up the the categories that the materials are divided into, and he and I wrote I I wrote a lot of them introductions to each of the each of the categories. Uh, I'm sorry, each of the religions that are represented. And so in those little brief little, um, I don't know, it's four or five pages, it's not very long. But what we did is we summarized each of those new religions in terms of their history and beliefs and practices and any controversies related to them. Um, so I think I've, I've had people to tell me down through the years that they really enjoy reading those brief little summaries and then they can go on and look at the primary documents if they want to that sort of further illustrate what we're trying to say. So, and that was, we designed that for use in the classroom. That uh, I, I use it in teaching my own course on new religious movements. Uh, it's a way to hear the actual voices, so to speak, on, in print of people from these various religious groups. And in some cases, the, the primary documents are excerpts from their scriptures or it might be, in the case of Jonestown, uh, it's, a, it's a transcription of a, a tape that was made at the end of the Jonestown debacle. Uh, we just tried to get a wide variety of types of primary sources. Uh, another thing would be what you mentioned at the beginning, the five volume set that I co-edited with Eugene Gallagher. And there what we did is we got scholars who were experts in the different new religions to write brief essays designed for a high school and college age reading audience. The idea was that this would be a reference work that high school and early college students could use for their research papers if they wanted to. But it, it provides a nice entry into a wide range of new religion, just very brief essays that cover uh, any number of them, plus topical issues like gender and new religions or anti-cult and new religions and so on. Well, Mike, this is this has been illuminating, and um, I will uh, uh, post a link to your new book and um, some way for people to contact you. And um, again, I remind people there's a much more um, a longer podcast about new religious movements and uh, uh, talking about Mike's book. So, Mike, thanks very much. Thank and, you. And uh, we'll see you on YouTube. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye.